You are listening to KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank, your partner in possible. What's up, everybody? I'm BJ Kissel. This is KCSN Update, our daily chief show and podcast here at KC Sports Network. Appreciate you for spending part of your day with us. And it's Monday, so as per usual, I'll be joined by ESPN's Matt Miller, who will share his stock up, stock down report following the Chiefs' 31 to 13 win over the Las Vegas Raiders on Saturday. But first, it's time for a quick word from our partner, DraftKings. The NFL playoff picture is locked in and is my go-to place for wild card and round action is DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. To kick off the road to Super Bowl 57, new customers can bet just $5 and get $200 in free bets instantly. Plus, all new and existing customers can get a no-sweat bet each day of the wild card round this weekend. Just place any NFL bet of your choice, and if it loses, you'll get a free bet back up to $10. Action so good, why bet NFL playoffs anywhere else? Personally, I'll be paying attention to that Buffalo Miami wild card game. Can you imagine Tyreek Hill and the Dolphins coming to Arrowhead in the first playoff game for the Chiefs as they've got that first round by? I know it's not likely that Miami beats Buffalo, but man, that would be a fun one to kick off the playoffs there at Arrowhead. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code KCSN. New customers can bet $5 on the NFL and get $200 in free bets instantly. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code KCSN. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, let's welcome on Mr. Matt Miller from ESPN. As his season is kicking up, got a big game tonight, recording right before the national championship between TCU and Georgia. Matt, before we get into your stock up, stock down, give us, uh, I might say your thoughts on this game, because by the time this gets out, it's going to be dated and you don't want to be, right. uh, most of the list is going to be after the show or after the game is played. But uh, yeah, thoughts on how things uh, are heading into the wild card round will stay on the NFL side. No, I'm excited. I think this, the playoff seedings, I mean, there was the confusion, you know, following the, the cancellation of the Buffalo Cincinnati game, but right. I'm excited to see, you know, what happens there with the chiefs being the number one seed. Obviously I think the NFC side is really intriguing. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. even more uh, like in the AFC, it feels like there's three really good teams, the chiefs, the bills, the Bengals, and the NFC, it feels like it's a little bit more wide open. I think some of those mashups mm-hmm. are a little more fun. Um, you know, Philly being the number one seed is a great story, but like, I mean, we get a third Seahawks 49ers game and that's a rivalry that I, I think it's one of the most underrated in the NFL. Um, you know, we got the giants and the Cowboys in there. Like, it's just, it is, it's going to be a fun postseason. I don't know if you're this way. I like had to mourn a little bit Sunday night, like the regular season's over. And I'm one mm-hmm. of those people that I know it's our job and for some of us, it's a relief when the season's over, but I'm actually just pretty sad that the football is wrapping up for us this week outside of the playoffs. It's always a weird time because I feel the same way. It's just like there's so many more games. And I know they start to count. This is what you always look forward to. But the other part of it, and we've seen it a little bit, this is where coaches, GMs, for a lot of these guys, not so GMs because their cycle is a little bit different. Coaches get let go. And you know from getting to know some of these coaches and their families and just how this whole business works uh, that there's so many people behind the scenes that are affected when teams start to make decisions, uh, like Texans moving on from Lovey Smith right. uh, after another one-and-done year after David Coley from the year before. So uh, obviously it means that new guys are getting their opportunities, hopefully. Uh, not a lot of retreads. Get some of these young coaches that have been doing so well around the league that their names are going to be thrown around over the next few weeks, you know, as teams you know try to jo- jostle in position or jockey in position uh, to get, you know, these young coaches, um, you know, to lead their franchises. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Broncos, with the Cardinals and some of these teams. But I always, towards the end of the year, I start seeing all these firings. Didn't really hit me until I worked there and got to know some of these coaches. And Chiefs yeah. obviously had a lot of success. It wasn't necessarily like that with them. But uh, you see around the league and you just get to kind of know them and their families, how, you know, cutthroat this business can really be right. uh, as far as you get into this. No, it changes you because you get too comfy. Yeah, when you're a fan, you look at like either your team fires the coach and you're like, okay, good, we needed to restart. Or, you know, like growing up a Niners fan, I would see like the Cardinals fire their coach and be like, yeah, like we did that. You know, it's like because you can't beat my team, your coach got fired. Then you get, like you said, you get to know the people and it's like, man, you feel badly for them. Or, you know, even like the assistant coaches who, you know, obviously they have a, a major hand in, in what happens, but, you know, Cliff Kingsbury gets fired and 25 people lose their job. And I think sometimes right. we we do forget that side of it. They're obviously paid well. 
Um, you know, it's, it's a high stress job though. And uh, <laughs> there's a reason I'm working at ESPN and not trying to work for an NFL team. It's just because the, the quality of life is, is tough. It's, it's a different world. For sure. All right. Let's, let's pivot to something a little more positive. Let's get into your stock up, stock down report. We've got uh, three in the stock up. Do you have any stock down? No, Do you I, have anything gonna, you want to- I got nothing. Okay. Uh, I, I came good. on here with you last week, BJ, and I said that what I wanted from Kansas City was an ass kicking. I wanted that mm-hmm. statement game heading into the postseason to be like, okay, all is well. And that is exactly what happened. I'm going to be real with you. I stopped watching this game and started watching other game or, or mm-hmm. I started doing stuff around the house because I was like, okay, until the night game comes on, I've got some time. I mean, this one was at halftime. I was pretty checked out. Um, yeah. as was Patrick Mahomes and a lot of the starters at that point. <laughs> All three phases played well. We saw Harris Butker and James Winchester, Tommy Townsend put it together, go four mm-hmm. for four and extra points. They got their field goal, so you can feel good about special teams going into this one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I want to give it away, but that's not one of the three stock ups that you've got, so it's going to be a little bit shorter of a show than normal, but uh, let's go with your first stock up. Not a huge surprise. Number 15 will soon win his second NFL MVP award. He should, man, unless unless the, the voters are just, you know, mad or biased or something. He should. And, you know, it, it was, I think, a, a really good game to put a, you know, a button on a fantastic regular season to go over 5,200 yards, 40 touchdowns, um, and just to reestablish himself as the premier quarterback in the NFL. And at 27 years old, that's not going to change anytime soon. So Mahomes is absolutely a stock up. Um, and, and I think, you know, you and I and everyone else, we talk a lot about the stats. I think what does get lost are the intangibles, the leadership, the yeah. football IQ, the ability to take, you know, so many new guys under his wing this year and, and get them up to speed because sure, like that falls to Matt Nagy and Eric Bieniemy and, and the position coaches. But as you know, so much of that falls to the quarterback to spend time with his receivers, spend time with the backs to get everyone on the same page. You know, we've seen that not work in places like Green Bay. And I think that's another thing. Like, don't take for granted how special Patrick Mahomes is that you can completely almost revamp your receiver core and have another MVP t- caliber season or an MVP season, hopefully. Uh, so it's definitely, I mean, stock up on week 18, but also just on the whole damn season for Pat. We got, as we're talking about Patrick Mahomes, and we got a little breaking news here as we're recording. Something just went out on Twitter. I want to get your thoughts on this because this is a player that uh, I know you and I both spent some time talking about going into the draft a few years ago. But uh, Patrick Mahomes will be soon be the first quarterback in NFL history before the age of 30 to have two MVPs and a Super Bowl MVP. And he's like, he's going to do it when he's 27. Yeah. Uh, years old again continuing to rewrite things and again we saw uh with the 202 yards he had against the raiders rushing plus passing combined that patrick Mahomes has the most yards for a quarterback in a season in nfl history it's crazy uh, only goes to explain how uh especially is considering what they lost with tyree kill and one of the two or three best wide receivers in the game and a guy that makes uh, a lot of yardage a lot of simple plays uh become huge chunk plays uh mm-hmm. to give a little more context to how special what we've seen from patrick Mahomes. they haven't had the those easy yards that right. we had seen in the past from him but uh take a we'll just go stock up brett veach just because of in general everything but when it is this adding to brett veach's stock up that according to field yates um our buddy from espn uh the chiefs are signing wide receiver john ross to a reserve future deal fun fact the chiefs now have the ninth and tenth picks from the 2017 nfl draft uh within their franchise now john ross is not eligible to play in the playoffs right, this is a reserve right. future deal uh but for a player that uh could absolutely fly matt initial thoughts on this move before we get your other couple stock ups typical this is very typical brett beach <laughs> and you know one of the one of the very first conversations i had with brett when he I don't even think he was the GM yet. It was, it was probably while John Dorsey was still there. And it was about this philosophy of you always take a chance on a a player that was drafted highly. If you get that, Mm -hmm. if you get that second chance and we've seen that, you know, Deandre Baker, the list goes on and on of first round picks that Veach has taken his son. Kadarius Tony, Cam Irving. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, there were some linebackers over the years that he's also done that with uh, guys that you had a high grade on. You think, OK, maybe mm-hmm. it was the situation. Maybe we can maybe we can flip things around. I, I think that's the same with John Ross, who's sneaky young. I think he and Mahomes are actually the same age. He was pretty young coming out of college. One of the fastest players in the history of the NFL. So why not? Why not take a chance yeah. and, and see? You know, they did this with Josh Gordon. It didn't work yep. out, obviously. But I think you 
very, very, very low risk, you might as well take the shot because you never know when it's going to work out. And we've talked about it. The only guys under contract for the Chiefs mm -hmm. uh, at the wide receiver position beyond this year were uh, Sky Moore on his rookie deal. Marquez Valdez Scantling signed that three year deal. And then Kadarius Tony, after they made the trade, right. because he's under contract for a few more years. So, like, McCole Hardman's a free agent. Justin Watson's a free agent. Uh, Juju Smith Schuster is a free agent. So, to get a player under control to be one of those top eight guys to compete with a player like Justin Ross, right. who had started to make some waves in camp and started to look pretty good before uh, he got placed on injured reserve and ended his season before it began. Uh, but yeah, to your point, very much a Brett Veach move uh, mm -hmm. to sign reserve future deals before their season is done with a talent. Uh, like we see John Ross will be a fun guy to watch in OTAs and training camp. John Ross can be a fun one to see how that, that all plays out. Like let's go back to your stock up, stock down as we move on from that breaking news. Uh, you've got uh, defensive player of the year candidate uh, here in Chris Jones listed as well. My gosh, we talk about Chris Jones every week on this show, BJ and two and a half sacks on Sunday to just put the nail in the coffin to me. I mean, it's Nick Bose is probably going to win defensive player of the year. Chris Jones should finish second and, and it should honestly be pretty close. Uh, I think he's, I've said, I think I've been saying it for, I want to go back and find the first time I said it. It was early in the year that he was having a first team, all pro season. He should be a unanimous first team, all pro Chris Jones should be uh, just a great year. And not only the stats, but the impact, the leadership for a young group um, has been amazing. And, you know, we saw Frank Clark leave the game Saturday. Maybe some of that was precautionary given the scoreboard. But without Frank, you know, due to suspension uh, this year, Chris really had to step up and he's done a fantastic job. So, you know, he he deserves all the accolades that a defensive tackle can can get because, I mean, really outside of Nick Bosa, I don't think there's a defensive player who is better this year. And you could probably make a strong argument that, that Chris has been as good as Bosa. Yeah, 15 and a half sacks ties his career best. And I think the one thing we talked about it with Chris and I got reminded because I forgot about this stat. Uh, but when you get to Chris's level where he's been an all pro, he's been one of the best interior defensive linemen in the NFL over the past uh, four or five seasons. He's in that conversation. Uh, you should say when he's at his best, how yeah. dominant he is. But this is also a player that does not have a career postseason sack. Uh, and That's there's a crazy lot of people and, and sacks aren't everything. And, and right. I'm not saying that as a knock, but I've been making the case that players at Chris's level, that's been a phenomenal player during the regular season. His legacy is remembered. And when you start thinking about the handful of plays that he's made, people will point to postseason sacks. They do it with Frank Clark because mm -hmm. Frank Clark hasn't done it in the regular season, but you look at the postseason, he's the only guy active in the NFL with more postseason sacks uh, than Vaughn Miller. That Frank Clark's got 11 postseason yeah. sacks. Frank fifth turns all it on in, in NFL in history. Yeah, exactly. So you want to see the same thing from Chris Jones as a player that yeah. has been absolutely dominant. But the way in which fans will remember him and talk about him in 10 or 15 years, they start pointing out individual performances. Most of those aren't from regular season games. Right. They're from the playoffs when it matters going up against Josh Allen or Joe Burrow uh, in the games that when it counts. So hopefully we see that from Chris Jones. You know, he's got it in him. You know, he can be one of the most dominant players in the NFL when he wants, uh, when he turns it on like that. You need to see that again. Let's stay on the defensive side. Uh, final stock up. Another player that you and I have been talking quite a bit about uh, on this show every week and Nick Bolton. He came this close, BJ, to making you some money on your DraftKings bet. Second in the NFL I don't want to talk about tackles. the fourth quarter. I don't want to talk about the fourth quarter of that game. Four four tackles? Is that what he was short? I think it was four tackles. No, he was – Nick Bolton was leading the league in that foyer Alakon. Yeah. Uh, sorry if I butchered that name. The linebacker for the Jags uh, was four tackles shy going into the fourth quarter, and I think he had like six or seven tackles yep. in the fourth quarter. He had four in a row on one drive. And he's good. And I was watching the He's game just absolutely crushed. Yeah, uh, but Nick Bolton deserves to stock up. 108 tackles on the year, became the leader uh, in the middle of this defense that has been missing um, since – God, before Spags even got there, since Derek Johnson left. I mean, they've been missing this player. Yeah. Nick had a great season. And I, I've said before, the, this exceeds my expectations from a player that I actually really like coming out of Mizzou. I think it exceeded the expectations of a lot of fans as well who thought Willie Gay would become this guy. Um, not to say Willie can't have that breakout year next year, but Nick Bolton has established himself as one of the best young inside linebackers in the game. And he deserves... You know, again, deserves a ton of credit for the the step that he took this year and the consistency. You know, to have 16 tackles in week 18 uh, says a lot about your competitiveness and your drive and your conditioning. So uh, hats off to him. He's definitely a stock up player. 
Yeah. It, anytime you, your season's any, I think you said 108. It's actually 180. Uh, just a uh, sorry, 108 solo. 108 solo. 108 solo. Yeah, 108 solo, 72. Yeah. Is, man, that's crazy. That's uh, 180 <laughs> tackles total, which surpassed Derek Johnson's franchise record. I talked about that on the 10 Things episode. If you haven't caught that here at KC Sports Network, go back on the audio channel or on YouTube. Go find 10 things. It's actually listed as 23 uh, things and records and stats that were broken. Uh, it gets longer and longer. Patrick Mahomes is responsible for like 60% of them right. every time I do that show. Uh, but Nick Bolton surpassing Derek Johnson, who went to social media, uh, talked about how much he's praised him. If you've been on our YouTube channel, you see Derek Johnson joins us every week and breaks down the Chiefs defense with Mike DeVito and Craig Stout. He spent a lot of this season talking about how impressed he's been uh, with Nick Bolton. And so it's yeah. exactly what you want to see uh, from the vers- former Missouri product uh, that is stepping up and having a huge season for the Chiefs. No, exactly. And I think to have, you know, uh, we'll get into the offseason when it's the offseason, but it's a roster that has to get younger, had to get cheaper to accommodate, you know, Mahomes contract and and some of the things that you're going to want to be able to do on the offensive line. George Karloftis had a great year. Nick Bolton had a great year. Uh, Trent McDuffie, once healthy, had a really, really good year. We're starting to see Brian Cook get involved. So I, I think, as you said, stock up to Brett Veach because, Two years ago, I started talking a lot about you're going to have to think about how you turn this roster over as guys just get older. It's a natural part of the game. D tackles aren't, you know, uh, they don't stay at the top as long as quarterbacks do. Same with receivers, same with offensive linemen. You got to turn that that roster over. And I think what we're seeing with these young guys like Nick Bolton is that Brett Veach is doing a hell of a job of, of finding those the next wave of, you know, this dominant chief cycle. All right, last thing before we let you go. Again, we're hanging out with ESPN's Matt Miller on this episode of KCS and Update, presented by our friends at DraftKings. Matt, I just want to get your quick thoughts. Give me like 30 seconds on each AFC um, wild card game this weekend. I'll go by schedule. First one this Saturday, the Los Angeles Chargers perhaps missing Mike Williams, which is yeah. a whole – you do an entire podcast about <laughs> right. that, and I'm sure there's a lot of them taking place uh, with Chargers fans uh, right now. But L.A. Chargers traveling to Jacksonville Saturday night, 715 Central Time kickoff. What do you like about that matchup? I mean, you know, Trevor Lawrence taking that next step into becoming an elite NFL quarterback, bringing his team to the postseason. Doug Peterson's done a great job there. I'll say this in Jacksonville, sneaky, hard place to play. You know, that's a long trip for the Chargers, obviously, for those of us who've looked at a map before. But Jacksonville's a hard spot to be in. Remember, a year ago, the Colts go down there trying to win the AFC South in, in Week 18. Jacksonville whipped their ass. So don't be surprised if the Jags win that game. All right, you heard it from Matt first. All right, Miami at Buffalo Sunday at noon to kick things off on Sunday. Yeah, That's the one I'm going to be watching for sure. Uh, what do you think? What do you think takes place in that game between the Dolphins and the Bills? Yeah, BJ, it's so hard to know. Is Tua playing? We're sitting here Monday night and no one knows. And it sounds like we won't know until Wednesday. I, I think the Bills are just too good. And say what you want about momentum and things like that, but they they're just they have a little more to play for right now. You know, with Demar Hamlin being released from the hospital today, it's fantastic news. But you know, they've they've got that that extra kick right now of, hey, we're, we're playing for something bigger than ourselves. And the way the Bills looked on Sunday, I, I don't know that there are many teams hanging with a team that plays like that. Yeah. All right. And finally, Ravens at Bengals Sunday night at 715. That kickoff. What do you see going on between those two teams that a uh, lot made about that game and where it was going to be taking place with all the yeah. changes of what was going on with uh, the DeMar Hamlin and that Bills Bengals game not being played. But what do you like about that matchup? Yeah, I mean, again, who knows what the quarterback situation is going to look like. Well, Lamar Jackson has been out for five weeks now with a knee injury. Back-to-back years, he's missed five games. He's a free agent. There's a lot There's a lot of intrigue with that. Um, I think the Bengals are the better team, even with Lamar Jackson out there. And again, another team that Zach Taylor, the head coach, was not very happy about the situation with the playoffs and the cancellation. And yeah. there's a team that also has a chip on their shoulder right now. So I'll, I'll take the Bengals. I think the playoffs, it's like you don't see a lot of blowouts. I think the Bengals win that one pretty easily. All right, so Matt's taking basically all the home teams. So Jacksonville, Buffalo, Cincinnati. That was not Cincinnati. on purpose, but yeah. <laughs> all right, and then the, the Chiefs will face the lowest remaining seed uh, after the first round of the playoffs is done. And then you got that Monday matchup between the Cowboys and uh, the Bucks that will wrap up a wild card weekend. So you have a game on Monday night, which would be pretty interesting, be uh, nice. to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. 
spread those out a little bit, but, uh, but yeah, everybody appreciate you for hanging out for this episode of KCS and update with ESPN's Matt Miller. You can catch all of his work covering the NFL draft in the NFL at ESPN. You're, you're about to get a lot busier, my friend, a lot busier. And I'll tell you, I, today I, I spent all day getting organized and ready. You know, we're about a week before the deadline for players to declare the shrine game is senior bowl are coming up. And it's, it's great. As sad as I am that the season's ending, I'm, I'm very, very excited. This will be my first full year at ESPN for the draft. So I'm, I'm excited to, to see the types of content that we can put together. There you go. All right. Appreciate everybody for hanging out. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe or follow us on your favorite audio platform. We'll have the KC Laboratory tonight live at 8 p.m. Central Time, or you can catch that podcast audio the day after on your favorite podcasting platform. Appreciate everybody. We'll see you next time.